Hi, and thanks for joining us for Understanding New Science Assessments and Avoiding Common Pitfalls. My name is Francis Vigent, and uh, if you are on the live session today, I'd like to let you know that we're going to save a bit of time at the end of the session for questions and answers. Um, you can enter questions on the right side of your screen by clicking into the question panel, or to show the question panel, there's a small arrow, I believe an orange box with an arrow in it, that you can click to reveal your question pane. So today's webinar is focused on assessments under the new science standards, whether you are an adaptive or an adoptive state. Uh, California would be an example of an adaptive state versus an adoptive state like Arkansas. Um, Massachusetts would be an example of an, ad an adaptive state as well. Nonetheless, these are all states whose standards are next generation. Um, the adaptive, uh, in the adaptive state uh, sort of nomenclature, just means that the state has made some choice to perhaps mandate something in addition to what the next generation science standards mandate. So in the case of Massachusetts, there has been um, a few tweaks where they've added standards and they have used uh, cross-cutting concepts as an organizing schema, for example. In places like California, um, there has been specific decisions made about w uh, which standards need to be mastered by the end of what grade levels in middle school, for example, where next generation science standards approach middle school as a grade span and sort of leave that more open. So, so nonetheless, the assessments that are intended for these types of standards are very unique. And as we get into this, what I'd like to let you know is that there's obviously a lot of anxiety about what these new assessments look like. If you're from District of Columbia or Illinois, you already have operational assessments in place. So you have a good look at that. Those things are going to evolve over the coming years. If you're from a NECAP state, and we're going to get into this a little bit later, New England Common Assessment Program, you've had a years of exposure to uh, next generation style assessment. And those assessments are actually referenced by the National Research Council in the uh, Guide to Implementing Next Generation Science Standards as models for next generation standardized assessment. But what I want to spend this time on is not just a standardized assessment. I want to spend a lot of time thinking about classroom level assessment. Um, because if you understand what next generation science standards are looking for, uh, you can actually implement these assessments now in your class and you're going to reap the benefits without waiting. And so I've broken down today's discussion into three key areas. Um, one, a focus on the idea that NGSS uses an entirely different model of assessment, uh, particularly, and this is particularly at a classroom level. Secondly, take a look at these uh, common pitfalls that are um, a, really a legacy from the assessments that most folks are used to and what's necessary as a result of this shift. Um, and there's sort of these you know, common ideas that, that and shifts, particularly between uh, summative assessment toward formative assessment that we're going to discuss here. And then thirdly, some helpful tips and techniques to take away in terms of um, next steps and what to do with this information. So jumping right in, uh, replacing summative with formative assessment. Summative assessments, and many people don't know the difference, a summative assessment is a high stakes record. It is something, and again, think of it like a, a grade at the end of a course or a report card. Um, that is a high stakes record. It's, in, it's infrequent. It's a judgment of what's been accomplished. And most of the time, uh, the summative assessments that exist historically rely on student memory, summary, and application, not necessarily creating, evaluating, or analyzing, which are the higher order skills uh, that these new standards are focusing on. Formative assessment is frequent. It's low stakes. It's an opportunity for improving instructional practices, as well as helping understand, uh, students understand where they can improve. So another way to think of this, it, it, formative assessment is a frequent opportunity for 
understanding how well we are teaching and how well we are learning. And so teaching from a teacher's perspective, learning from a student's perspective. Formative um, assessment is really all about diving into students' thinking and eliciting and, or soliciting evidence of that thinking. And to do so through the tasks and activities that are part of the school day. Um, we'll talk about this a bit more, but really tasks and activities should essentially be formative assessments that should be really a seam, they should be seamless. If it's a good activity or a good task, it should function as a formative assessment. And we'll talk more about that. And ultimately, the purpose of a formative assessment is to improve student and teacher performance versus to have, again, like a report card, a summative A, B, or, or C, or one, two, three, four grade, that's sum, summative. Formative is all about what can I observe here in the moment now, and how can I use that to improve my learning or improve my teaching? Okay, any next generation assessment should integrate all three dimensions. By dimensions, what I mean is, is those disciplinary core ideas, the cross-cutting concepts, and the science and engineering practices. And, it, and, and assessments, no matter if they're more summative versus formative, they should always be serving a purpose beyond just a grade. Now, it drives me nuts, but there's a lot of, you can just Google, or go on Pinterest or do whatever you'd like. And you can look up things like fourth grade next generation science tasks or fourth grade next generation science assessments. And you will find over and over all of these things which are not uh, quality formative or uh, assessments or tasks that lend themselves to something that's formative as well. And so these are just examples um, and we're going to point out why something like this is not a three-dimensional task or assessment in a moment okay so some of the things kind of go without saying things like crossword puzzles asking a question like how are our pellets formed and just a big fill in the blank explanation um, over here we have you know pictures put them in a row and describe give a description of the pictures um, again that's all very lower order thinking not part and parcel of a process of investigating a question or a problem and really you know forming the question or problem from a context this one here is really tricky uh, because you see here it says investigate right you'd think it would be an investigation well what you have is a scenario and you have um, a bunch of instructions and the students are just uh, carrying out the instructions. There's not an analysis uh, in sort of going through identifying a problem or question and then pulling that through a plan into an evidence-based solution. Okay. And there are other, and this is another one, um, assessment. Uh, this is very low order thing in photosynthesis. Plants convert what type of energy into what other kind of energy? Well, um, just remembering, right? A next generation science assessment is designed to give insight into the effectiveness of instruction. Now, you may say remembering the definition of a word is showing that, and you, that your instruction is effective or not, but you have to remember that the result that instruction is all about enacting curriculum and the role of curriculum is to engage students as scientists or engineers under these new standards to develop the skills and the ability to connect concepts, that's what we call cross-cutting concepts, the, to understand the behavior of the content, to be able to develop and actually use that content to solve problems and answer questions. Okay, so, so there are multiple frameworks. You can almost think of each dimension as a kind of framework that a student is going to be required to perform um, produce evidence of mastery of those frameworks in different sort of uh, clusters. So when an assessment is designed to give insight into the effectiveness of instruction, really the, ins it, it, the question here is what is the instruction like? Okay, so, so if this is what instruction is all about, remembering the definition of a word, then 
uh, that's not appropriate NGSS instruction. So I don't want you to get confused here. Um, it's designed to give insight into effectiveness of three-dimensional instruction. An assessment is also designed to monitor teaching and learning over a long period of time. Assessments like this are, you know, the kind of thing that students would sit down and do in an afternoon or a day. Um, these are little activities, but really, again, not part of something that's clearly cohesive. Uh, a next generation science assessment has to be assessing frameworks that persist beyond a specific lesson or unit or even year. So think of NGSS assessment as being systematic if it's really NGSS assessment. And then third here, the series it produces a series of indicators that track whether students are provided with adequate opportunity to learn in three dimensions. And you may say, well, that sounds like it's the state's job. It's not. It's actually the job of the curriculum um, and the assessments that should be a part of that curriculum that are occurring regularly. Now, uh, I'm going to show you a little bit more later how that looks in the classroom, but the point here is that <clears throat> when you have a, a cohesive uh, series of indicators that are in place across classrooms and from one unit to the next and from one grade level to the next, you can actually observe student growth. So that's what this is all about, okay? Understanding, so you could sum these three up as understanding that uh, instructional pedagogy is properly enacting curriculum. Uh, you could say that it's helping to monitor not just the teaching, but also the learning over a period of time. So you can see, you can see a, a, a growth curve, and then you can see a growth curve, not just within the year, within a lesson, but from one year to the next. And you can use that in order to identify gaps in instruction, gaps in, um, in learning, okay? Always NGSS assessments are three-dimensional, and we're gonna jump to that in a second. Now, thinking systematically, um, kind of, again, breaks down into these three different areas. In order to have a system of assessment, first of all, you're observing all three dimensions sort of simultaneously. So that means that students are engaged in disciplinary content with their skills, so that's the science and engineering practices, and as part of that, they are making cross-cutting concept connections, okay? Now, in order to create a, a, a assessment system off of that, you need not only the curriculum to be um, sort of a set scope and sequence with scaffolding, but beyond it, you need a thoughtful set of priorities for assessment because students develop, the science and engineering practices are a set of skills, some of which rely on others, so they're inter interdependent, and some of which develop more quickly than others. And so you think of maybe focus correction areas in this context. So in order to have uh, or develop an assessment system, you can't tinker with your old assessments and, and get them to be something that's three-dimensional. What you really need to do is you need to look at uh, curriculum and you need to look at the three dimensions and the clustering of the um, science and engineering, sorry, the uh, performance expectations in each of the units. And as the lessons progress, you need to make deliberate choices about what focus, what are the, the skills and content and cross-cutting concepts that are the focus of that. It doesn't mean that it's exclusive, uh, exclusively what you're teaching. What it means is that as a teacher, this is your number one priority to develop the student's capacity. Okay, so an example of that may be um, arguing from evidence. If that is the focus for a particular assessment or a particular unit, okay, uh, at that point of the year, then the assessment should be assessing that focus. It doesn't mean that all the other science and engineering practices are not part of that lesson and unit, but it means that your assessment priority may be a, is a specific subset, an intentional subset of the science and engineering practices. Um, 
assessment takes place over multiple years, and that's really thinking as a school or a district. Um, your system of assessment is not just within the year or within the unit, um, you know, chapter one assessment. What it is is it is something that is uh, unit to, lesson to lesson, unit to unit, and from one year to the next, so that you can see student growth. A student should be able to show growth over time in your assessment system. Um, where this all begins is in that classroom. Do you have an environment where a three-dimensional assessment that is formative instead of summative can take place on an everyday basis? And what what you see, you know, what you start to see here is, and I'm as we start to get into what these assessments look like, what you start to see is that the activity and the tasks are essentially, so the, think of the instructional or the learn, where the learning comes from, the instructional activity or the task that students engage in, in that next generation classroom, should be seamlessly designed as formative assessment. Okay, if students are engaging in an activity or a task that is not a formative assessment, why are they engaging in it? It's, it's essentially a rote, a rote process at that level uh, or ancillary, okay? Now, uh, when you think about the assessment, when you think about the assessments, it's important to think about them in terms of uh, not what I was showing you before, the sort of, you know, I don't care if you do it on a computer or on paper, you know, fill in the number, fill in the word, select the number, select the word, whatever. What you need to think of it as is different ways that students can perform the expectations of the standard. So an example here is a fourth grade life science standard where students are expected to be able to demonstrate that they have mastered how to construct an argument that plants and animals have internal and external structures that function to support survival, growth, behavior, and reproduction, okay? In order to demonstrate that understanding, a student has to, found in a foundational level, have specific skills from the practices dimension, specific content knowledge from a uh, disciplinary dimension, and specific systems thinking, uh, sort of uh, habits of mind in a sense. Uh, systems thinking is just like what you see here. A system can be described in terms of its components and their interactions, stability and change, input and output, okay? A student should be able to connect these disciplinary core ideas using cross-cutting concepts in order to help, again, demonstrate their understanding of the standard. The way that plays out in class is uh, in sort of a, a five-step process in a way. And what's important here and that how that gets demonstrated, so how does a student actually um, get assessed, but also, you know, how do they learn through the assessment? Because I said that assessment and teaching and learning is sort of seamless here. Okay, well, if a student has to construct an argument that plants and animals have internal structures, so on, it starts with phenomena the actual context of plants, for example, or animals. Students need to make connections with that context. They need to understand the purpose of it, really why this matters. And so those are the concept, self, world connections. And the purpose of that is generating questions and ideas. And now that we have a sense of why, it's all about how. How do students actually um, take those questions and ideas further. Well, they need to plan to investigate those questions and ideas. So they have to plan the work. Um, this is the context. This is why it matters. This is how I think my question or uh, idea or the problem is solved. And then I plan that out and I carry out that plan. And my purpose of carrying out that plan is to capture what impact uh, my idea has on the problem or question. So this is this is what it really means. This is what the problem in question really means. Okay, what it is is my idea a solution? Is my hypothesis an answer? And then I have to argue that out through evidence. Okay, 
So does or doesn't what I thought would be the solution or the answer actually serve as a solution or answer? What's the result? Because here's where we're carrying out the plan. We do that to capture data, right? And we use that data to formulate a result. And so what goes into that result is, well, first of all, the problem or question that I'm out after, my hypothetical solution or answer that I tested and the plan I carried out that I created, and then a claim about that. Okay, it, it, it was effective. It did effectively solve the problem or it didn't. And here's the quantitative evidence for, that I gathered from carrying out my experiment to support that claim. And here's my reasoning behind it. Okay, at every stage of this process, there are multiple opportunities to engage students in formative assessment. Okay, Socratic dialogue. There are many ways. So you can kind of go through this. The first bit, it can um, take place through some nonfiction reading. Second bit can take place through Socratic dialogue. Third bit takes place as students apply their uh, science and engineering practices in a scientific or an engineering process, which they carry out. So again, this is, this is all related to the concepts that are disciplinary core idea dimension from steps one and two. Three is uh, science and engineering practices, again, in the context of the disciplinary core ideas. Number four is all about integration of science and engineering practices and English language arts um, common core standards into, and it's happening at three too, into that experiment, sort of um, carrying out the experiment, that, that lab environment. And then five, again, all of the same frameworks are coming together, another opportunity for assessment. And uh, I'm going to take you a little further here, and I apologize for the level of detail and nuance to this, but in order to capture and assess three dimensions, the students need to be engaged in three dimensions, which is why those assessments I put the big X's over and showed you earlier are not next generation assessments, because they lack this um, phenomena driven uh, opportunity to engage in the practices and the cross-cutting concepts in, in sort of multiple ways, okay, and from multiple angles. So one way that we engage this is using uh, science engineering practices with as elements of uh, science or engineering processes, okay. Now, Science and engineering are not linear. Um, we're not talking about scientific method. You know, uh, here's your lab. Write it on. I write it on the board. You copy it down. And you you follow a, a cookbook um, recipe kind of uh, thing to to carry out an experiment. Cookbook recipe stuff. Um, you know that is not next generation. The purpose here, and I want to just focus on question, that there is that the science and engineering practices are assessed as students reason their way from a problem or a question to an evidence-based conclusion. And those science and engineering practices get sort of combined in different ways. And they also combine with the other dimensions so that students are actually performing the expectation of the standards. So just focusing on question here for a moment. So if you think about a question, we know from the, from the National Research Council that science is defined as knowledge from experimentation. That, that teaching children science is all about teaching them how to answer a question or solve a problem through experimentation. Okay, and so Students in a scientific context need to engage first in questioning. And it's not random questions, it's back to that phenomena. Okay, if we're learning about whales in the ocean, or we look at the context, I shouldn't say learning about. See, this is the thing it's a switch. It's not about, you know, next generation science classrooms are not about teaching about or learning about, it's about all is it's figuring out. It's all about figuring out, okay? So if the context of the phenomenon is whales in the ocean, then 
how do we figure out something about these whales or the ocean which is important important to me important to the world okay that's where we go from the phenomena to the student connections now when we've identified something that's important I have an idea or a question about that how can I carry how can I create a plan and carry that plan out plan first then carry out in order to get evidence about whether this idea really makes sense okay so that's why you see these different sort of stages in a scientific process I'm just going to focus on question and I'm going to show you from no Adam uh, grade 4 unit 5 an example of a question and what I've done here is I've highlighted in the question the different elements of the three dimensions and this is just one piece at the very beginning most simple piece of starting into science as a student right in that uh, sort of third stage I showed you a moment ago on that arc so the question is how does the shape of a bird's beak affect its ability to collect different types of food hmm that's the question now that directly relates to the performance expectation for dash ls1 dash one constructing an argument that plants and animals have internal struct and external structures that function to support survival growth and reproduction the context of this is the different kinds of birds that live in our environment or in a specific environment not a general environment okay so we can look at a specific ecosystem look at the birds that live there and compare even different ecosystems and the types of birds that live there and really dive into <clears throat> how the shape of the bird's beak affects its ability to collect different kinds of food that engages science and engineering practices because we're students are asking a question right so this would be a student developed question disciplinary core ideas the structure and function the shape of the bird's beak and the cross-cutting concept is the system and systems model dimension how it affects its ability to collect different kinds of food okay cause and effect so the reason you can't and then obviously so the student generates this question this we can we can this the, a student engaging in generating this question we can formatively assess this first of all does the student understand the context the, the, the context for which we're investigating number two does a student understand how to properly form a question okay there's no word because in here it doesn't end in a period there's there's no if then okay now where does a student go from here so so we can formatively assess this and we can give feedback we can actually question the student in a checkpoint and we can give feedback so as a teacher when when students engage in the scientific or an engineering process every stage of that pursuit of the question or the problem towards an evidence-based solution is an opportunity for a formative assessment now from a practical standpoint it requires a, a release of responsibility it requires teachers to take that role of of coach and for students to take on the role of scientist and at that uh, you can't allow students to go through an entire scientific or engineering process without checkpoints so what no Adam does is we, we insert checkpoints and we do so at places where it's practical where it's frequent enough but not too frequent and the purpose of those checkpoints is to do what I just said it's to ask and, and to, to to make sure that the student understands the expectation and that they're getting feedback on how well they are meeting that expectation so if a student came up to me and they said they turned this into a statement they said you know the shape of a bird's beak affects its ability to collect different kinds of foods because some birds eat nuts and other birds eat ants okay I would say I would go back and say hmm and literally I would say to them can a question end in a period is this a is this a question or a statement and I would look for their response okay so right there I'm, I'm, I'm giving them formative feedback but I'm doing so in a way that's requiring them to to articulate for me whether or not they understand the expectation and if they don't know I'm going to turn back and say well a question it is a statement that requires an answer 
are you requiring an answer here? No. Does it end in a question mark? No. <clears throat> so I want you and your, your partner to go back and I want you to form this as a question. And before you do that, I also want to ask why you have the word because here. Is, do we have any evidence yet for why this is happening or why this may be happening? Because signal, signals evidence. <clears throat> and so it's very important that um, students get this feedback right from the get-go. So, so that little one-minute interaction, and usually in the case of no Adam, students are working in pairs. So I'd have two students up here. They, it's like a marriage. They have to agree and act together. They would have the same question, but they've brainstormed it together. I would spin them around, you turn them and say, you know what, I need you to go back and fix this next you know, two, three minutes and come back and see me and grab the next pair in line and go through. And so that is an important opportunity for me as a teacher to understand, do the students understand the expectations? Where are they at in the spectrum of understanding how to uh, their mastery of that science and engineering practice? in their ability to uh, articulate across these three dimensions. But secondly, it, it communicates to the student what it means to learn well, what it means to demonstrate mastery of these three dimensions and this performance expectation and in this context. And it gives them specific feedback that they can then go and incorporate into their question. And they're gonna come back and show that to me before I, I allow them to progress further. Okay, so that's where this full release responsibility is important, but through setting milestones and, and checkpoints like this, um, you know, students get this repeated feedback in which you can, I hope you realize, is that questions, research, hypothesis, so on, all of these elements are part of every investigation. What's changing? It, the phenomena is changing. The student's ideas are changing. The performance expectations are changing. The particular practices, disciplinary core ideas, and cross-cutting concepts are changing, okay? But the overarching expectation of what question research hypothesis is and how the practices are uh, sort of applied doesn't change, but they get further refined, okay? And the cross-cutting concepts are further expanded, okay? So that idea of cause and effect, we see it here, we're going to see it in many other contexts as well. Why is this important? Well, students should demonstrate evidence of teaching and learning if they have mastered the performance expectation. So if this is what's going on in the class, right, students are, this is part of developing a plan. Once students have developed a plan, they go on to carry out that plan, they form their evidence-based conclusions. That has really been all student-centered. That has been students as scientists and engineers. You know, and I don't want you to think that I'm talking about high school level stuff. Okay, we've got third graders doing this. Okay, second graders doing this, and uh, even kindergartners. Okay, some of the supports are different, the nuances are different, but what I'm showing you here really is all fourth grade level. Okay, now this the, um, uh, that's on the screen now, this is a um, evidence statement. This is not no atoms. This is next generation science standard evidence statement connected to the standard that we were just mentioning. Okay, behind it is an evidence statement that says what the observable features of students' performance should be by the end of the grade level. Okay, so a student should independently, when they're required to engage in performing the expectations of the standard, should independently support the claim, identify scientific evidence, evaluate and critique evidence, and reason and synthesize, and to do so, in these very specific ways, okay? Now, the thing is that these are not tasks. These are the features of evidence that, that are observed within a task, okay? So if a student is engaged in the task of, of um, trying to answer the question of whether or not a bird's beak affects the kind of food that it can collect, that student needs to be able to um, make a claim to be supported about, a, about that phenomenon. And they need to be able to include the idea that plants and animals have internal and external structures that function together to help them support their survival, their growth, their behavior, and their reproduction. Um, 
and you know you can kind of I don't want to read these all to you but but basically they need they need to be able to pull across all these different areas independently and so the idea that um, you're going to you know that what the unfortunate practice that many teachers and schools get into the idea that you could pull released items and uh, learn the test and teach that to the students and somehow that makes them proficient is not it, that would work under the old standards where that were fact-based, but that does not work under these new standards. Okay, and the reason is is that this is too complex, it's too nuanced, and it's it's way too easy to under to see if a student has actually mastered performance. Um, I'm going to show you how that how that plays out here. And so the the vision behind the standards is really that students are engaged in uh, the STEM cycle that they understand the difference between science and engineering and the interconnection between scientific knowledge and technology with solves problems and how to apply ELA and math in order to uh, communicate, capture, and evaluate those observations, okay? Shifting away from that traditional model where teachers are the sage, the expert that tells and explains and demonstrates and towards the idea that in the environment where students are developing skills which are useful to develop content, observe cross-cutting concepts, and actually answer questions and solve problems. So teachers, bec teachers become coaches, okay? Common pitfalls here, well, it's number one, failing to, dem to differentiate the purpose of assessment. I think back to the assessments that had the big X's on them, um, those assessments are, are often aimed at rote recall, um, lower order thinking, remember, understand, apply, um, or just a grade. That needs to switch towards a focus on higher order thinking, which is create, evaluate, analyze. And you need to ask yourself, are you, do, are you engaging students in assessment purely for a grade? If so, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, you should be instead getting feedback or or data, think of it that way, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, it really should be both, on the on progress towards specifically targeted performance areas, okay? So think about targeting um, within an assessment. And the thing is, is your assessment can, can cover lots of different science and engineering practices, but you may only be grading or really focusing on one or two or three of them, okay? Uh, one of the hard parts of these new standards and the, particularly the science and engineering practices dimension is they can't exist in isolation. You can't teach one standard at a time. You can't assess one standard at a time, and nor can you um, assess uh, one dimension at a time. Although what you can do is you can isolate sort of your attention or your focus to a specific area, which you correct. I think of it as sort of trying to unstick certain areas so that um, you can make, students can make more, progress along a continuum into more other more difficult areas that are dependent on certain things. Um, for example, you can't argue from evidence if you can't ask a question appropriately, okay? Because you have nothing to argue from. You can't create a plan. You can't create an experiment. The data that you collect is irrelevant without a hypothesis that's related to a particular question or without a prototype that's related to a specific problem. Um, the other uh, purposes for assessment that are more appropriate is they really should be looking at the effectiveness of instruction, the effectiveness of the unit, uh, the effectiveness of students' understanding of what it means to learn well. Okay, and it's a two-way street. Um, so we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, the reason that it's important to differentiate is that if you are doing these lower order assessments are just focusing on grades. What you're actually doing is you're taking time on learning away from things that are more valuable. And instead of multitasking, you're basically wasting your time. Okay. Uh, how does the traditional approach toward assessment lead to this pitfall? Well, the traditional approach to assessment looks at specific facts. It, it is constantly about um, isolating something, getting students to know it, to recall it, and then moving on to something else. The problem is, is that with next generation science standards, what we learn is, is constantly becoming necessary and important to what we're going to learn. And what, so what we have learned is, is, is part of what we will learn. And so it never disappears. 
in a sense, if, it, if your curriculum is articulated appropriately. So if you get stuck in these traditional assessments, what you're, what's happening is, is that you're blinded to the other dimensions. Um, the traditional assessments tend to be a very small subset, or they tend to address a very small subset of disciplinary core ideas. Uh, if, you're, if your assessments remain traditional, then what happens is all you have any sense about is a very, very small segment of disciplinary core ideas. You're blinded to students' progress, the quality of instruction, the effectiveness of units, and so on when it comes to science and engineering practices, cross-cutting concepts, and really whether or not the students are producing evidence um, that they can perform the expectations of the standard. Okay, The way to avoid the pitfall is to really push everything off the table and think about how is every hour of time on learning an opportunity for students to engage in science and engineering as scientists and engineers so that they are going from a, from a phenomena into problems and questions which they're generating and that there's a trajectory that's created by this curriculum to go uh, through uh, areas of problems or, or, or different phenomena and, and problems and questions such that students get a big picture of what science and engineering is as a discipline, but also uh, as an opportunity to perform skills, to develop and use that content to solve problems and answer questions. Okay, so that's the key is formative assessment needs to be the majority of the assessment that you do. And it needs to be designed for next generation science standards. And it really needs to be part and parcel, se the seamless, um, you know, essentially the, the tasks or activities that students are learning through. Okay. The second pitfall, you know, failing to use assessment results to inform instruction. This is a constant issue. Okay. Under traditional instructional environments. Um, How can assessment results inform instruction? Well, if it's formative, it's an opportunity to reflect on why students aren't performing. And the questions to ask yourself is, is it the environment that we're creating? Okay, is, and what is part of the environment? Release a responsibility, is there enough? Students without enough re release responsibility cannot, they have no opportunity to engage science and engineering practices, period. So you can, if you, if you have a follow the leader model, I show you, I give you, I demonstrate, and then you do the questions in the workbook or, you know, fill out the sheet or follow this procedure and then ca gather some data that wipes every, almost every science and engineering practice and that dimension off the table. Okay. It makes cross cutting concepts be something, it turns into something that students learn by accident. And unfortunately, the dis disciplinary core ideas themselves are interconnected. So it, it makes learning those disciplinary core ideas harder because it's more isolated. And ultimately, all of those holes add up to something, which means that the students are never able to master the performance expectation. Okay, so environment is number one. And a big piece, which is part and parcel of creating the right environment is next generation pedagogy. Is the instructor enacting curriculum appropriately? Uh, the, ped the pedagogical model for enacting NGSS design curriculum is all about teacher as coach. It is not about direct instruction. It's about coaching students engagement in the phenomena and in, in questioning and then, then developing those questions through plans, which are carried out, you know, plan, planning experiments, carrying those out to gather data and use that data in order to form conclusions, which are evidence-based and well-reasoned, okay? So that's why I wrote down me. You know, uh, as a teacher looking at this, um, if to think about if it's the pedagogy of the environment, it's me, and that's something I can change. I have power over that, okay? Is it the student? Well, this is some place, unfortunately, many people go first. They say, oh, it's the students. You don't know the kids I have. You know, this is where they live. This is the kind of families they have. This is where they came from. This is how they speak English or they don't. Um, the bottom line is, is that 
there are very few, like well less than 5%, uh, I would say less than 3% of students who have those types of challenges, which can be overcome, by the way. Um, it's not an excuse, but it's something that we need to think about. Um, it's similar to special education, uh, IEP type environment. It's important that um, any time that it's the student, if you think it's the student, then the question is, is why is it the student? Okay, and if it's if why it's the student and you can identify a barrier, um, then you need to think about how to remove that barrier. I'll give you an example of how this happens all the time. Nonfiction reading. Okay, if you're working with um, students who don't read at grade level, you have English language learners, you have special ed students, don't make them read silently. It makes no sense. It's a ridiculous idea in a scientific context. Okay, if these students are in a mainstream classroom, then those are students who are at a verbal level where they can have a discussion. So they can hear words and they can think about words and they can discuss words and ideas and they have their own ideas. So th what you should be doing in the context of nonfiction reading is reading aloud. Okay, maybe you take some turns in the class, okay, or among your readers who can uh, read at a level, um, but nonetheless project the reader. Okay, read a little bit, ask a question, engage the students in, in the nonfiction um, articulation of that phenomena. Okay, that's how you overcome such a problem. Okay, so maybe in a sense it is the student if they can't read English, but they can speak it. But, you know, as a teacher, it's you, and I'm a teacher too, so I'm not trying to say you teachers and not include myself. You know, it's me if I put that barrier there, insist on making that barrier um, when it's something that's ancillary to learning science, but the, the actual engagement in this part of a lesson is necessary in mastering science. Okay, so there's a difference between sort of an access skill like reading versus the ability to access content and think about it, okay? There's two different kinds of access there. So it's important to take away from this, you know, l look for how to change, okay? How can I change? Why aren't students performing? And realize that all of change, no matter what, starts by identifying the right problem. And that's the key is, are you, are you identifying the right problem? It may not be the student. Most people go to the student and then the student has no defense, right? So maybe it's a student, maybe it's not. So you have to identify the right problem and try something new to find out. It's very scientific. Experiment to find out if you are correct. Okay, and if you are correct, then the students begin performing. Okay, doesn't mean they perform something different. That's important. Okay, it doesn't mean that we need to dumb it down. Because when you dumb something down, the students are not performing what's expected of them. They're performing something different. Okay, that's a major problem. Um, and how can assessments inform uh, the results of assessments, assessments and form instruction, um, sorry, and, and why do multiple assessment opportunities matter? Well, key piece here is that assessments are just data points. So just like I was saying before, the um, you know, why students aren't performing is important, okay? But secondly, taking that and using it for reflection informs your instruction. It's kind of sort of uh, almost meditative professional development, okay? But you need multiple opportunities for assessment because any given assessment is just a data point. It's literally a, a snapshot in time of where a child is at in a specific moment in relation to some specific task or skill or, or concept, okay? And the value of assessment is in gathering enough data points that you can actually see over time what a, what a student's level of understanding really is, okay? Getting enough snapshots that you can get a real picture as a result. Now, one of the things that people fall into related to this as well is the idea that students have only improved a little bit 
Um, so that must mean that there's poor quality teaching or learning. And that's very tough because sometimes it does. And I would say a lot of times it means that there's poor quality um, expectations of students or um, of teachers in terms of the kind of classroom learning environment they create. However, there is a productive struggle that should be a part of every next generation science class. So while the improvement may be small, that it's important that there's engagement in that productive struggle and that takes time. The key to keep, to keep in mind here is that if that struggle is really productive, it means when you come back tomorrow, you can struggle again productively and build further on that small improvement today. Okay, and this is where a lot of people get into discussions of things like summer learning loss. You know what? If there's a huge summer learning loss, then in your community, then there's a huge problem with the quality of instruction. Um, and the reason is is that students are are not um, developing a framework of understanding that persists. And so that is the purpose of instruction is to develop skills and understanding which persists okay and i'm not saying that you know the fact that you can't remember everything you learned in college today means that college was a waste of time and that teachers were bad but the bottom line is is that there are these reasonable periods of time and a summer is a reasonable period of time that a student uh, should not lose a quote unquote a grade level's worth of knowledge or half a grade level's worth of knowledge they should with you know within the first 10 weeks of school be performing at or above where they were when they left okay really should be above so so that's key all right can is is any gain that you're getting a gain that you are are building on tomorrow and are able to build on tomorrow and if not why <clears throat> um and how you can avoid it is is purely um use formative assessment and take those results reflect on them Make sure that it's, uh, those formative assessments are providing feedback to the students, but also you use that feedback yourself to improve your instruction. Um, next bit, using a, a pitfall, another pitfall here, is using assessments that are not designed for next generation performance expectations. Um, so overall, um, what makes an assessment designed for NGSS? Well, it's three-dimensional. Okay, it's something that is requiring students to create, evaluate, and analyze across all those three dimensions. It's something that is part of a continuum, okay, of concepts, of skills, and of cross-cutting cross concepts. What's the essential uh, elements of the NGSS uh, designed um, assessment? Well, essential elements are the three dimension sort of integration. But the other piece is that um, that it's an assessment structure that is sort of timeless within that grade level and increases in complexity over time and provides, again, those data points that are useful in understanding where a child is in a moment, but also over the course of time so you can see growth, okay? If you don't use NGSS assessments, that's coming back to what we said earlier, you will end up sort of blinded Okay, you'll be blinded to specific dimensions which are not being assessed. Um, and that's true of the task. Again, when you think about assessment and task being kind of one and the other, if, you're, if your tasks don't involve these skills in a full release responsibility sort of dynamic way, then students aren't gonna develop them. And if your assessments aren't assessing for them, you're not gonna be aware the kids don't have those skills. And then when it comes to the real test at the end of the year, then you're going to see a problem, okay? Because the real test is going to um, register that issue. So uh, the way to avoid it is to create those assessments or to, you know, if you are purchasing curriculum curric uh, systems like no Adam, then those assessments are, should be built in, uh, which in the case of no Adam, they are, but you have to know how to use them. A lot of people look at things like lab planning and they, they think it's not a formative assessment or they try to turn around and, and, um, you know, create a scientific method, write it on the board, old school kind of thing out of it. And that totally negates the opportunity for all of this uh, productive struggle 
and the formative assessment pro process for students. So they don't learn what it means to learn well and teachers don't learn what it means to teach well because they don't have the feedback um, from those students. So here's the helpful tips and techniques. And I'm gonna walk you through what a next generation assessment looks like. I have screenshots from one here. So um, assessment should unpack evidence of student learning. And uh, I'm gonna show you how that happens. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit here um, since we've kind of already hit some of those points. So how does it become three-dimensional? How does it sort of play out over time? And I just wanna show you that these types of assessments go back to 2008 in some states, okay? The NECAP assessment is an assessment that's commonly being quoted by the National Research Council as a model for next generation science assessments today. And uh, when I was a teacher, this was one of the assessments that we had in our, in our class in 2008. And, um, my class was, uh, I think this year we were number one in the state and our state was number one in the country. So this is one of my favorites. Now, the New England Common Assessment Program is the state standardized test for about four states in New England. And the way it's broken up, there's an inquiry task booklet where students work with a, a partner and it's actually a hands-on task. And then they transfer that information into a, a question booklet an inquiry uh, question booklet and or I think they call it inquiry item inquiry item booklet and what they do is they then use the data they collected independently not no longer with a partner to um, to actually answer questions and what that does is, is it teases out different elements of the standard now Obviously, this, the next generation science standards did not exist back in 2008, but I'm going to show you're going to see why this model is uh, is being pointed to for these next generation science assessments. And then I'm going to show you a, a next generation science assessment from DC back in 2015, which is not so long ago, which is an operational next generation science assessment. And I apologize, we're going to run over here uh, a bit, but I think this is worth your time. So here's how it goes: students receive uh, a scenario. Okay, they receive a scenario, and then what, they're, what they do is uh, they consider this question, and they're told that you know the people in Mrs. Brown's class have looked at these three different birds, and they realize they have different beaks, and they have this question, which beak will pick up the most different kinds of food? And they're told that Mrs. Brown gives her students these different materials, okay? They, some tools represent different types of beaks, some materials represent different kinds of food, and then they're said that you're gonna get the same kind of tools and materials that Mrs. Brown's class got, okay? And then they're asked to make a prediction. So what do you think? Okay, which beak will pick up the most different kinds of food? So make a prediction and write it in the box below. And they're given pointers in terms of what needs to be part of that prediction. And that right away, you see how there was a scenario that now a student is being asked to form a hypothesis about okay now they don't get they don't have to create their own procedure in this case this is a fourth grade assessment by the way um, but there is a procedure that they're going to have to follow and I'm cutting out there's a little placemat that they use to again this is a standardized test that happens at, at the end of the year and what happens is is that that procedure requires them to use the tools to pick up different types of um, food or objects which represent different kinds of food and fill that data into the, their data table, okay? And you can see it's being done in partners. Now that data table gets populated. The data that goes in there, by the way, is going to be different for every set of students, okay? So imagine that, a standardized test where not every child has the same answer, okay? And in fact, this data doesn't really matter, okay? What's interesting is, is that data gets transferred over to the inquiry task booklet and then what uh, students are asked to do is to graph it. Okay, so now we're going to see if whether, whether that student understands how to um, render that data according to, in this case, um, you know, specific, um, uh, you know, representing data in a graph form uh, appropriately. And then students are asked to take the data from their data table and to break it out and answer these questions. So, so if let's say that their partner filled out this data table, right? Well, this data table doesn't really matter. 
what can they do with the data? Can they graph it? Can they actually identify on that table which food was picked up by which tool? And now they're going to be asked which type of bird beak was able to pick up the most different kind of foods. Can they actually analyze and evaluate that question? See, this is all happening in the context of the birds, of the beaks, of the food, of Mrs. Brown's class, okay, of the task that we just did and gathered information. And then they're asked which bird beak picked up the fewest kinds of food. So not just in the positive, but in the negative, can the student use the exact data and explain the answer? How do you know? Well, and what happens if they're the same? What happens if two groups show that, uh, you know, let's say something like tweezers can pick up just as many worms as seeds? Next question related to this. Look at the bird in the food shown below, bird food. Based on what you've learned in your investigation, predict which food a bird with this type of beak would eat and explain why. Oh, so based on the task, based on the data I collected, based on the scenario that we were thinking about in Mrs. Brown's class, can I generalize what I've learned now to look at a picture of a bird with a specific shaped beak and generalize based on the data I collected, which type of food it would be able to pick up or most likely eat? Okay, so now we're making another step forward. It's not just about picking it up, it's eating it. Okay, because if you can't pick it up, you can't eat it. Is sort of the implication there. Next piece, Mrs. Brown class wants to learn more about birds in the schoolyard and the kinds of food that they eat. Uh, students want to answer this question. Which type of food uh, do birds in the schoolyard, schoolyard now eat most? Okay, so now we're going back to um, help write a procedure, write a plan. See, that's the thing. Planning is important. If students have been planning their investigations in your class all along, they are going to be able to construct a plan for how Mrs. Brown's student could figure out if what type of food that the birds in the schoolyard eat most. So they're going to be able to say what they need to observe, what kind of tools, and so on. Identify one thing in your plan that will stay the same in the investigation. Essentially, what's the control? Okay. This is from 2008. Nothing new. Nine years old. Almost to almost 10 years old now, okay? This is the model for next generation assessment because you can see that one phenomena, it's actually a series of phenomena, you know, what, what birds eat, what birds are, what their beaks are like, their physical shape and all of this, okay? Um, it combines those disciplinary core ideas with the skills, the science and engineering practices for students to actually develop that knowledge to answer a question like, which type of foods do birds in the schoolyard eat most? Okay, and there are these cross-cutting concepts like, well, if, one, if, you, if you look at what tweezers pick up and certain kind of birds that have tweezer-shaped beaks, if you look at a different bird and it happens to have a tweezer-shaped beak, what can we generalize about that? Okay, what would be the, what would be the the cause or the effect of having a beak of that shape in terms of the types of food or diversity of food that that animal could eat, okay? So there's no excuse. Um, you know, I know people are busy, but the idea that these assessments are sort of nebulous and are a million years from now going to be produced and operational, no. Um, they're operational already in several states. And at a standardized test level, um, our thing states have been using and been perfected. Okay, they need to be tweaked a little bit, obviously, to the, the content and specific skills that are required under the new standards, but we're not talking major departure. But I hope what you can see from this is, is that while this is paper and pencil, that students, and this is the whole basis of no Adam uh, in our curriculum, is that students should be engaged as scientists and engineers, actually be Mrs. Brown's class, engage in these ideas every day, and these skills develop and use that knowledge and content, okay? Do it hands-on, engage in the real phenomena, and you get these learning results, and that's why my class was able to be top in their state and among the top in the country, okay? We were always in the top five, um, and that's why. I mean, this is, you know, I taught um, using no atom. Now, the, the, the piece of this is, let's jump forward to, to 2016. This is a released item. Um, so the 2015-2016 uh, 
there's like a, you know, school years start and end in different years. And so hence the difference in numbers here. But nonetheless, this is the operational next generation science assessment at a state level from the District of Columbia. And you'll see the same thing. Here is a fictional class engaging in some activity with a certain procedure, a diagram, and then a data table and students are asked whose claim is correct, Trevor or Kayla, based on this evidence, explain why Kayla or Trevor is correct and use evidence to support that claim. Here students are being asked to form a conclusion, to create a conclusion by evaluating and analyzing what Trevor, Trevor and Kayla have claimed and have actually found. And then that evolves into how Tre Trevor and Kayla learn that different organi organisms survive only in certain environments that have the food and energy they need how would you construct a food web from these plants and animals? Explain how that model shows the shortest way for energy to get from a plant to a fox, okay? Further, Kayla's class looking at a food uh, chain here, okay? A look at the model of the pond and food chain. Which of the following statements best describes the movement of matter in that pond food chain, okay? Use the model of the pond food chain to describe the relationship between organisms in the pond food chain and the exchange of matter back into the environment. And what that's getting at is can a student not just be shown and say, oh yeah, the algae's matter goes to the minnows and the minnows matter or energy uh, goes to the perch and so on. Can the student actually say in the bacteria take the dead bass or the dead heron or a dead minnow and turn that back into usable nutrients in the environment for the algae so that it's recycled, that matter is recycled back into the environment and re-enters that food chain, okay? So again, with these very specific questions and the way that they get angled, you, the standardized test can tease out all the different dimensions and all the different disciplinary core ideas within a context. And that context is not something you can predict and these questions are not something you can predict. That's why it's a really great assessment because the students have to actually be able to perform the expectation of the standard, which means that instruction has to actually have given students the opportunity to learn as scientists, to actually engage in the phenomenon, to productively struggle from a problem and question to an evidence-based conclusion. And that diversity of ideas in the classroom um, has been the form from, for arguing from evidence and actually learning uh, how to create, evaluate, and analyze appropriately like this, okay? Uh, and then so on, you know, it goes on and on and on. So um, just wrapping up here, and I'm gonna grab some questions. So if you have questions, please drop those in. Um, this is another uh, next generation assessment. Now these are state level assessments. Uh, the classroom level assessments though, if you go back to what I showed you with the bird beaks, and we talked about with the bird beaks, you know, uh, Students in NOATOM are engaged in learning about environments. Students in NOATOM are engaged in Socratic discussion and learning about, um, you know, those, making those concept to concept, concept to self, concept to world connections. And students in NOATOM are also planning, taking those questions and problems that they identify and planning experiments or prototypes off of it, using their plans to actually um, uh, gather data, which is the basis of their conclusions, okay? So they live every day the expectations of these assessments, which are the expectations of the standards. And they live that through dozens and dozens and dozens of contexts all year long. Okay, so every week things are changing. Units are a month, they're not three months. They're not, you know, a, three units a year. We actually have nine units. They're not, they're, they're entirely different because next generation sciences are entirely different, just like the assessment's entirely different, okay? How authentic exper uh, experimentation and assessment take the place of direct instruction? It's that productive struggle, okay? Everything I've described to you is none of it has been teacher telling about, okay? Explain about, show about, demonstrate about, okay? None of that. It's about students developing skills and expanding their knowledge by experimenting and prototyping and presenting their ideas and getting constant feedback. Those, those checkpoints, engaging in the planning, engaging in the thinking, getting the feedback, incorporating the feedback, representing it, moving on, okay? 
what's great about this is it's an opportunity to multitask because the learning tasks are dual purpose. They are formative assessments. From a teacher's perspective, I'm seeing how well that student understands my expectations, how well they are connecting with the disciplinary core ideas, what level of skill they're able to demonstrate, and whether or not I need to redirect them or the entire class based on whether I'm gathering the same formative feedback from all of my teams or just from one or two. Okay, very, very important. So that's how you get from this multiple opportunities sort of matrix that I was talking about to something that's sort of uh, phases of a, of a lesson, something through nonfiction reading, Socratic dialogue, students planning investigations, carrying out in those investigations, and then forming conclusions and debriefing. Okay. Last slide, I promise. Um, how to use formative assessment as a practical tool to support your teaching and learning? Well, release responsibility, number one. Have specific checkpoints, number two. Uh, make sure that those checkpoints that are happening, like I was mentioning with a scientific process, you know, question research hypothesis, we have a checkpoint, and then we're going on to, you know, materials uh, and procedure checkpoint, or materials checkpoint, procedure checkpoint. What's the point of a checkpoint? Not to give a check, not for one student, for a team to come up and say what they've done. It's for all those team members to come up, to explain what, you know, to present what they've done. And then for me as teacher to ask questions and to make sure that, um, they're, that they're clear, that they're meeting the expectations. And then I, I say, go ahead. I want you to go on to X. As soon as you're done, you have, you know, three minutes, five minutes, whatever it is. I want you to come back up and see me. Keep them moving. Okay, give them the feedback, either you turn them or let them go forward to keep them moving. And not only is that engaging, but that's valuable because that feedback is meaningful way that a student can actually meet your expectations in the short term, which they appreciate. And for yourself to understand your practices and actually gather uh, these data points, measurements, um, because this is something that can go into a grade book if you want, you know, checks, however you want to do it, or at least your mental um, sort of this, you know, collective conscious of where is this student team or class at and what do I need to do to change my teaching so that it improves the learning, okay? And we mentioned multitasking. Okay, so quick recap, um, and I'm going to grab these questions. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. So folks have lots of questions here. Um, some folks have asked questions like, <clears throat> um, does scientific method still align with NGSS? Um, this is a great question. Um, I'm glad somebody asked this question. So the answer is, it depends on how you use scientific method. Um, the way that people traditionally use scientific method doesn't align. The idea that um, it's kind of used as a fill in the blank or you give students a you know something on the board that they copy or you give them like a scientific method sheet and it becomes this kind of linear rote process that that doesn't align okay the kind of old stereotype of you know the droning science teacher doesn't align but the scientific method or scientific you know it's just another name for scientific process that science is process that engineering is process there is not necessarily one universal process. Um, if you go to industry and you look, processes are everywhere. You can't make progress. You can't document things. You can't have a, um, a result that you can replicate without process. So it's really like a small s, small m, okay? Not proper noun, scientific method. Um, but the, the value, the reason that scientific method can and does align with NGSS comes from the need for logic and process, okay? And this is one of the areas that the new standards um, are conflicted on because they say that um, sci through scientific process and through engineering process is how the science and engineering practices are reflected. But um, they denounce the traditional application of scientific method. The reason that they denounce that is, is that the way it's traditionally used is this 
you know, um, you know, just give me your lab report and move on. The students aren't really engaged in the logical evolution of a problem or logical evolution of a question. So if your students are engaged in the logical evolution of a problem or uh, in the case of science, it would be a, pro a question, the logical evolution of a question in a scientific process, you could call that scientific method. It's kind of one and the same. Okay. And the thing is, is that um, it behooves you as an educator to apply a scientific, have a, have a, um, a, a universal scientific process and a universal engineering design process so that the expectations of your students are clear to them and to you and you have a common element to work towards. And that's what No Adam does. We've, we have tested, uh, I showed you the scientific process up there. We have tested this for a decade. Um, and as all of, I mean, the reason that we're NGSS designed today was a result of a huge amount of work on, on behalf of our team uh, in the recent past uh, since the standards have come out. But we were also very close um, right from the beginning. We've been around for 13 years and um, we produce un incredible data in some in incredibly challenging environments and even other um, environments that are maybe more, you know, people might think of as cushy educational environments, but nonetheless, the students are coming to the same high levels of outcomes, oftentimes near double state average in terms of uh, students scoring in proficient advanced or exceptional categories. And the reason is that um, the students are learning multiple frameworks. Okay, the scientific process and the engineering design process are two different frameworks one for pursuing questions, one for pursuing problems towards evidence, and, but they both go to evidence-based solutions, okay? If a student has mastered that framework, that is, a, that is mastery, really, of those science and engineering practices. But the thing is, is that can they do it independently? Can they do it across context? Can they do it in a way that is um, engaging the cross-cutting concepts, okay? And, and are they doing it with full release responsibility? So, so so the answer to your question is, it is aligned depending on how you apply it. And the thing is, it's not really about you applying it, it's about how the students apply it, okay? Other folks have asked questions about uh, if the webinar will be available or the slides will be available. The answer is uh, yes. So you will receive after the webinar, um, if you're on the live session, usually it's about three or four hours after the webinar, you'll receive a, a link in a an email uh, that, will take you to a page where the video is available. If you would like the um, slides, I'll give you my contact information. You are welcome to reach out about that um, and somebody will get you the slides. I'm gonna move on to another question here. Um, some folks have asked about Given shifts in pedagogy and assessment in the classroom, what differences or obstacles are anticipated with the coherence between classroom instruction and assessment and the large scale sort of uh, state level assessment? Um, so I think there's a couple ways to view this question. And so I'll, I'll try to explain both. Um, so if the shifts are happening appropriately in the classroom, the shift in the state level assessment will reflect that, that shift in a positive way, okay? So think about it as the state level assessment is shifting to the new standards. If the classroom has shifted to the new standards in both you know, curriculum and pedagogy, the learning results should have shifted, things should align, and you're good. The problems come up when the shift that's happening in the classroom is not an appropriate shift, it's not a full shift, or it's a shift in the wrong direction. Because what happens is when the state level assessments shift, people who have not made the appropriate shifts in curriculum and instruction are going to see their data suffer. And that's gonna create some hard feelings and it's gonna create uh, some struggle. And unfortunately, um, you know, there's a lot of programs that are being marketed nationally um, by large companies that say, you know, we adapt, our curriculum adapts to your instructional practices. Well, guess what? 
if you're if you buy a curriculum that adapts to your teacher's instructional practices, you should probably throw it away. Because under these new standards, instructional practices are shifting. It's a very, very small percentage of people whose instructional practices um, reflect next generation instructional practices or pedagogy. And so if your practices were already there, there's no need to shift your curriculum or your instruction. So that's why I say if you're you know, buying a curriculum that says that it, it, it adapts to um, your teacher's instructional practices, it's really not worth anything. It's not going to produce um, the kind of shifts that is necessary. And that's the unfortunate part. I think the uncomfortable part of, uh, of this question is that um, you, what you saw with Common Core ELA and Common Core Math, where people didn't really understand the vision for the standards, they didn't really understand this sort of um, skill as well as content type standard set and, and the requirements of it, that they went out and they bought things that they didn't understand or they created things in-house or they tried to tweak what they had and they, they said that it was aligned and they thought that it was aligned and they, they then ran into the assessments and realized that their data wasn't good. And so then they either blame the assessment or they blame the curriculum or they, when really, you know, a lot of it had to do with understanding what the vision was to start with and having the proper communication. Now, I think that that is, I think the communication is better with these new standards uh, for science. But um, the other thing that's potential here is that assessments um, may fall short of the vision of the next generation science standards. And we see some evidence of that in some places already. Um, especially at a district level where people are buying um, assessments or, you know, unfortunately creating your own assessments are oftentimes worse than the ones that are purchased unless it's a district enacted resource. Um, and there's a lot of data to show that. Again, I'm a teacher myself, but um, that lessons and assessments that are highly modified by individual teachers have um, been proven to result in lower quality lessons or more likely, I shouldn't say that it's all, you know, what I just said, I would like to reframe that, that um, the, that lessons and assessments that are the results that are highly modified by individual teachers have a higher probability of being rated as low quality than those which are enacted district wide or district level. Okay. So that's the thing. Probabilistically, um, individual teachers and this sort of fragmented approach that's part of the tradition is not the way to go about it. It's, it's really um, pulling teams of teachers together, selecting resources that way. But also, you know, the leadership that's necessary here is that uh, you need to resist the snake oil and you need to do the hard work. And uh, whether you're creating it in-house or you're buying it elsewhere, th these new standards represent hard work. And um, the state level uh, tests as well, you know, um, that is going to be a function of what state level decision makers decide to replace their current uh, assessments with. But really the trend is towards what I've shown you. Those are already in place in different places and quite, quite reasonable, you can, you can quite reasonably expect that the assessments that you're used to are so far away from what these other, stand these other tests are like at a state level that um, the, the kind of the two or so, they're just the opposite ends of the spectrum, they're incompatible. Um, and that's that. A couple more questions and then I will have to jump here. Let's see. Unfortunately, a few people had to leave. Um, let's see here. Sorry, there's a lot of questions and some of them are pretty long. Let's see. Um, some people are asking questions around pacing. Um, 
and kind of making some interesting statements at the same time. So uh, high school or elementary level, these standards uh, require a fast pace. Um, they need to be taught in clusters. They can, and this is true of high school, elementary, middle school. There, there's no such thing as teaching a specific standard and then you move on to the next standard. Okay, if, so that's another thing. If you see that happening, that's a pitfall. Um, these standards don't work that way. Now, the thing is, is that uh, things like vocabulary and checkpoint quizzing is not, um, is not a, a formative assessment. Okay, those are summative assessments. They can be, on, on some level, they can be useful to understand if a student can match a word to its definition. But that's not the expectation of students uh, on these uh, next generation assessments, um, not when it comes to college board uh, AP tests, not when it comes to uh, state level next generation uh, tests that are operational, because it is a combination of skills and content. And, um, and that's just the reality. Um, so, so everything has to emanate from phenomena, and then the reality is that that the assessments are a skillful layering of questions which tease out the um, student's mastery of the three dimensions in relation to that phenomena. Okay, so it's not something that lends itself to checkpoint quizzing and to vocabulary sheets or worksheets or that sort of thing. Um, so so that's, that's the reality. The way that you're able to keep a fast pace that's required by these standards um, is, you know, one, not teaching a standard at a time. They have to be taught in clusters to make sure that the phenomena context for any lesson or unit is um, diverse enough and is, is the right phenomena context so that the activities actually are the form the formative assessment so if a student is doing a lab okay what it means to quote do a lab needs to be uh, engaging all of those three dimensions and then that is the assessment okay just like I said the students are forming their question they come up they get that checkpoint okay that checkpoint is part of their progression and their learning in the moment that's how they're learning but it's also my assessment as a multitasking and getting them to shift to the next uh, phase. Okay, so so that's the way. So they're not two. So the, the just the mere idea of of a vocabulary uh, piece or a checkpoint uh, or a you know a quiz kind of a thing is it's a little bit of an anathema to the you know what what's being gone for here. Now in our curriculum we we do have vocabulary. Um, assessments and concept checks um, but really I mean we always tell people we, we don't care if you do these um, the bottom line is that the number one assessment is the student the release responsibility to students engaging them in the planning and using that that's first and foremost the the other little checkpoint uh, you know vocab whatever you know that oftentimes is just to I mean it's a nice extra data point but it's it's really ancillary it, it serves as homework ticket to leave that sort of thing um, it's more of an organizational piece than it is a, a, some deep meaning piece. Um, it has meaning, so it's not it's not useless, but it's just not the it's not the core value. A concept assessment, in, in our terms, really follows that kneecap model of assessment, at, and those are things that teachers can use, um, and it's part of that that system of assessment that I was talking about earlier. Every unit has one so that teachers can use those in a summative sense to see how students perform in, in, in with the concepts in unfamiliar context. So we learned about this in class. Now we're going to change to a whole new context that's related but different and see if you can extend what you've learned. Can you apply it? Can you demonstrate the skills? And if not, that sums up for that unit, but it also informs us for the very next unit where at the end of that, we'll also have a concept assessment available. But again, students don't learn through 
you know, a discrete sort of add-on assessments the way that they should be learning um, through engaging in the practices every day. And that's why the tasks and assessments need to become one, and that's your formative sort of thing here. All right, I'm going to take one last question. Okay, questions about um, just about where the folks can get uh, samples and things like that. Um, you're welcome to go on our site and check out noadam.com and you just go to the curriculum section and you can download example lessons and units and you can see you can see that we've given teachers um, a lot of guidance to see you know exactly how labs progress. Um, now, again, it's just an example because all the student teams are going to be different, but they have good ballpark data and so on. Um, and then we also have the other assessments as well, and you can see how that goes. Unfortunately, what's online is only one um, unit. It'll have multiple lessons in it, um, and students reading nonfiction reading material. But all of the um, units, full year for every grade level, kindergarten through eighth grade, um, is available for purchase through NoAdam, along with, so not just the curriculum scope sequence, teacher background, lesson plans, and all of that, but also the materials um, for each of those units are sold as a kit to go with it, and, you know, consumables and tools, so nobody has to buy anything on their own, and also the professional development. We take care of all that online and, and so on. But anyhow, I appreciate your time, and I apologize that we did run over. If you have any questions that haven't been answered, I know some folks have asked to be emailed. Um, we will do that. Otherwise, I wish you luck in your pursuits, and have a wonderful day. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.